edition of the second of our climate days. And this afternoon we're going to have uh, two panel discussions with uh, titles that are maybe a little bit less provocative, but hopefully the discussions will be as rich as this morning. And uh, the first panel is about uh, innovation, innovation for climate, what is the role of entrepreneurs. And uh, the panel will be moderated by Laurence Lemon ortega Professor of Strategy at HSC. And uh, Laurence, the floor is yours. Thank you. For being with us. Thank you. Thank you, Igor. Thank you uh, to, the, to all of you for being here this afternoon for this uh, discussion about the role of entrepreneurs in uh, climate change and in innovation for climate. So as you know, later this afternoon, there will be a session more how big company, how corporates can make the change. But the session, the first session here is really about entrepreneurship. And we didn't only talk about startups, we also want to talk about just any entrepreneur, any venture that starts and to address, to innovate, to address climate change issues. And so we're very happy to have our four panelists here this afternoon. So uh, I'll start on my left with uh, Fabien uh, Alali, who is the founder, the co-founder of HD, HD Rain, and who will talk to us about what his company is doing. Then we have Emma France. So Emma is uh, the uh, director of the Center for Social Entrepreneurship at HSC. And so she will talk to us more from a global perspective, um, how this um, center is helping uh, companies to be created with a social dim dimension. Then we have uh, Fabien. Uh, and then I need to read my notes to, for your name because it's not that easy. Couchet-Chian, so Fabien Couchet-Chian is with us today and he will talk to us about Genomines, so in the mining industry, yes, you can believe it. And then we have uh, Emeric Penven, who is uh, the head uh, of uh, the, the Creative Destruction Lab at HSC and he will explain what the, the Creative Destruction Lab is doing and especially the, the arm that is focusing on climate. Okay. But let's start with our two um, companies, two startups uh, here, and I will start with uh, Fabien. And uh, ask you, Fabien, uh, with, uh, sorry, Ruben, <laughs> ask you, uh, Ruben, so you told me that your company called HD Rain, so high definition rain, um, you managed to convince your first investor by a 20 seconds pitch. And so I will ask you before you give us the details of what your company is doing, maybe you can do us this pitch and see how you managed to convince him. No, no, no I'm, I'm stressed, a bit stressed. So <laughs> 20 seconds in order to explain to you what uh, HD Rain uh, does. We deliver and we disrupt uh, weather forecast by connecting devices to your satellite dishes in order to receive a television. So each time you see these dishes, we are able to put a device and to analyze the electromagnetic waves and give you a minute per minute, a 500 meters resolution, uh, rainfall measurement, and up to two hours forecast. Okay, so can you go into the details, maybe talk to us about the technology, how, how why this is disrupting the uh, conventional weather forecast industry, and what is specific about this technology, and basically what your business model is? Yes, so um, the, the idea is to, to connect these devices and why we do that. Maybe I took some step up apart and, and I explained to you how weather industry, industry, meteorological industry works. So in order to have your forecast on your smartphone, we have to observe and to measure a lot of uh, atmospheric parameters with weather station, satellites, weather radars on ground, and we have a gap between developed countries and developing countries. So um, in order to have the little alert on your smartphone and to have the warnings on television, we need big infrastructures and very massive investments uh, in order to install and to deploy weather satellites, weather radars on the ground, and there is 80% of territories on Earth without this technology and without the capability to warn you if you are uh, on a place with a flash flood coming. In 80% of countries in the world, you, you will not have the, the warning. Uh, so it's not a lack of uh, scientific knowledge. 
It's a lack of uh, infrastructures and investment in, infra in infrastructures. So when we created HD Rain, it was uh, at the end of my PhD and the PhD of my co-founder, and we saw that we, we had some disruption in electromagnetic waves coming from existing satellites and existing uh, antennas. And when it rains between the satellite and, and the dish, uh, there is some perturbation, fading. If you analyze that and you do some uh, signal treatments, you are able to, to retrieve an information at a lo lower cost than traditional measurements uh, tools or, or sensors. And with a, a very big accuracy if you deploy a, a network of sensors. So that's, that was the, the, pitch, uh, the initial pitch of uh, HD Rain. And we created the company four years ago saying that with the existing infrastructure, we will be able to, to deliver to you a 500 meters high resolution weather forecast. So that, that, that's the, the beginning of uh, HD Rain. And, and uh, so Robin has just said it, but it's, uh, you've been around for four years. And actually, today is your fourth anniversary, is this right? Exactly. OK, so congratulations. I think we can. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. And yeah, we, we start, we, we were two, two people in the company in 2018, uh, two people full time and the third co founder part time. And now we are 17, so I'm really happy to be here uh, today. It's a very special day, and we, we have a lot uh, to, to launch in the coming uh, weeks. Okay. So maybe you can give us an example of um, a, a country where you are particularly present is Côte d'Ivoire. And can you tell us what you do there and, and how your technology is helping um, the, the climate issues there? Yes. Uh, so we, we deploy since 2020 uh, almost 200 sensors like uh, this one in uh, Côte d'Ivoire, so in two areas, in, um, in, in Abidjan and in the west part of the country. Uh, why it is important in this area? Because they you have um, uh, two seasons, a dry season and a rainy season. And so the rainy season is right now in May and June, and then there is a little rainy season in November. And in the, in the economic capital of uh, Côte d'Ivoire, there, there is a lot of uh, flash flood events with uh, kill death every year almost. And the issue was to deliver a forecast to, to, to the, the weather agency there, it's called Sodexam, and we design a system which is able to anticipate up to two hours in advance uh, uh, problematic uh, thunderstorms and flash flood events on the city, in the city. So in order to do this deployment, we, we put the sensor and also we offer the television to the people accepting the HD RAIN sensors. Then the information is coming up to the, to the computers of uh, the company and we deliver to Sodexam a two hours forecast of uh, rainfall accumulation and rainfall intensity in the, uh, in the area of Abidjan. And the second project, which is very important also uh, considering the, the modification and the, the climate change affecting the weather condition, I, it's in the west part of the country and there we deliver for several companies uh, weather data, very accurate weather data for cocoa production. And cocoa production in Ivory Coast represents a high way to obtain some uh, uh, devices. Uh, and and also it's a big the biggest uh, export uh, production there and it's the first producer of cocoa so when you have this informa this information it's useful because the the climate change there uh, is um, is changing the 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 rain patterns mm. so you have some uh, disease developing in the trees so the cocoa pod are affected by uh, swollen pot, spot and, and so it's very important for them to have the correct accumulation of what happened in the past in order to anticipate the production, the future production. Mm. So your solution um, is very low cost compared to conventional 
very centralized solution. So can we say that you have a very low cost decentralized solution as we can see on the on the picture there yeah. versus the conventional that is very centralized and very um, and very costly. Yes, and, and there is a couple of advantages in doing so because if we have a, a device not working or a, at in, in place in one place as we deploy a network of sensors, it's uh, very helpful to have the, the the next sensor working and then deliver a partial information, but in information. And when you think at the centralized system, if you have a if it's not working, it's not working, you are blind in the complete area. The second thing is that when we deploy this kind of uh, sensor, so the, the, the picture on the right, it's uh, in south of France, it's not in Ivory Coast, and we deploy it in uh, with uh, firefighters. And in Ivory Coast, we deploy it in the, uh, the equivalent of mayor uh, in the, the different uh, cities and, uh, and the part of uh, Abidjan. So you you have the, the interest of the people uh, with the sensor at their home or at their place. So you, you, you increase the, the sensibilization to the climate change issues and also to the, the importance to have the correct uh, weather information at one place. So when you are decentralized like that and low cost, it's easier to upkeep your system in time and to have a, a, a powerful tool because a lot of people are concerned. So when you deploy 200 uh, sensors, you have 200 people concerned by the, the system and uh, talking about it around them and then expand it. M it's easier to expand the, this kind of technology. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, thank you, Reven, for this uh, first introduction to HD Rain, and uh, we're going to talk also about decentralized solutions because this is, I think, is key uh, for many uh, many startups. So let's now go to, um, to and talk to Fabien, uh, and Fabien is going to talk to us about Genomines, and we're actually going to talk about the mining industry, which is probably one of the most polluting in the world. So Fabien, what are you doing in the mining industry and why are you here on the days about climate when you are in mining? Yeah, good question. <laughs> um, so basically when we met with my co-founder, uh, Dali, we, we wanted to solve major issues. Um, she's a doctor in biotech, in plant biotechnology, and I'm a former mining engineer. And so um, we figured, um, okay, in the past, um, added miners basically managed to find uh, huge deposits of metal. And so we figured that actually a combination of vegetation on a certain places would be great indicators of, okay, there is this kind of metal here, there is gold, there is nickel, et cetera, et cetera. And so we thought like, okay, there should be an interaction between the metal and the plant. And we discovered these plants called hyperaccumulators. So they hyperaccumulate nickel in huge quantities, several percent of their biomass in their tissues. So we figured, okay, what if we would modify this plant, genetically speaking, in order to increase the uptake of these plants? And that's exactly what we're doing at Genomines. We are genetically enhancing hyperaccumulator plants to absorb nickel in soils. We are planting fields of these plants, recovering the biomass, and in the biomass, through chemical processes, we are recovering the metal and we are producing um, three types of products at the moment, nickel sulfate exhydrate, nickel oxide hydroxide, and nickel class one, which are metals that are used directly in the battery market. The problem today is that in the mining industry, um, so you have, in the nickel mining industry, you have two types of deposits. And one of these deposits uh, that is very concentrated are called sulfide deposits. They are located in some area um, in very specific countries. So in order to produce this metal for the batteries, you need to focus on these deposits, which is creating tension and a lot of pollution for the environment because it, it means that you need to move around a lot of material actually. So sometimes concentrate that are only one, two, three, ten percent uh, concentrated with the metal. So you're moving around a lot of material that is actually totally useless for you in order to do the downstream processing in some places like China, et cetera. So what, what we are doing basically is that we are shortening uh, this value chain in order to produce the metal on site and recover the metal on site directly to sell it to the clients. Mm. So it's a farming business. Exactly, we are farmers. We are farming for metals. Okay. 
and your farming. So, so can you explain us how this will work on a local area? So how do you, do you need land? You will identify places where the, the concentration in the, in the land is very high and you just plant your plants and that's it? Yeah, exactly. So the way it works basically is that miners, when they investigate certain deposits uh, that we are that we are calling ultramafic laterites, basically, uh, for 2,000 sites that they identify, they only mine one or two most of the time because they are looking at a lot of different criteria, like um, is it accessible, is the concentration um, high enough, all of these kind of things. So basically, they've done the work for us. They've done the exploration work for us. So we are just taking their work and operating on fields that they have identified in the past that were low concentrated because at the moment we are operating at concentration that are 10 to 15 times lower than what miners are able to address. Mm -hmm. So it means that we are able to open a lot of producing countries that were not able to produce uh, nickel in large quantities in the past. Hmm. So that's, of course, there is a geopolitical political issue here also because all those metals, those rare metals, are produced in places where there can be conflicts, wars, and so there is also an issue around this. Yeah, totally. Um, we are actually uh, in this situation right now uh, with the war between Ukraine and Russia, right? Uh, Russia is producing only 8% uh, of the total consumption of nickel in the world, but around 17 to 20% of the nickel class 1. So the nickel class 1 is the nickel that is used uh, to produce the cathodes uh, of the batteries. Mm. And so where, is, where are you in your technology Today, so do you already are you already at the experimentation stage? What stage are you in? Yeah, so we are a very young company. Uh, we have one year and four months now. Uh, so we developed a prototype at uh, at lab scale, and now we are uh, propagating our plans to operate directly uh, on sites. Uh, so we intend to operate in Albania, um, the U.S., and South Africa for the month. Okay. And so those will be experiments that you will run in the coming years, in the coming months, right? Yeah, yeah. actually, yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay. And so, Fabien, your company is part of the uh, Creative Destruction Lab. And uh, so can maybe we can uh, turn to uh, Emric now, and so that Emric explains what the, what the Creative Destruction Lab is doing and how it's helping entrepreneurs, uh, especially in the, in the field of climate change, uh, thrive. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so maybe to take a step back from that, um, since we are HHC, you know, we know that what we learn at school regarding entrepreneurship is usually very, um, let's say, removing all of the ideas that an entrepreneur can have and saying, okay, go to a specific market, ask questions, get all of the feedback that you can, and from that feedback you can infer some common problem and hence develop some solution. So Creative Destruction Lab is basically the opposite of that. And because Creative Destruction Lab is focusing on science and technology-based venture, meaning that you start from people who have developed, like Ruben or Fabien or Dali, uh, developed a, a specific piece of technology, a piece of IP, which can have s potentially s a lot of application in very different industries. And so the purpose of Creative Destruction Lab is to take a technology which is very versatile, very proteiform, and to help those founders uh, find the right industries, the right business models, the right structure to take that technology and change it into a company with the most massive impact as possible on the world. So this is really the ambition that we have, take a technology with potentially many applications, and pinpoint the one which is at this particular moment, so really very, very time sensitive and in terms of practicality, what we can do with that technology. And to do that concretely, what we do is that we gather uh, a panel, uh, a pool of mentors which are world class in their domain, either as scientists or economists, as um, company founders, so we have uh, multiple unicorn uh, founder among our mentors or uh, people who did the massive exits or investors or uh, industry operators. So we take all of those people, we pull them in the same room and we basically create a kind of a temporary advisory board for the companies. And so someone like Fabien can come with a piece of technology 
that has a huge potential, come in front of that mock advisory board and with his current problem, his current updates, uh, the role of that room is to provide two outcomes. The first one is to determine with Fabien what should be the key objectives for the next couple of months. So really determine a kind of a high level roadmap. And the value from that is that anyone can give advice, but when you do it in a room, it becomes peer reviewed advice. And so it's really the back and forth between all of the mentors that provide a higher quality of material for the, uh, the entrepreneurs. So this is the first outcome of, the day, uh, of that day. And the second outcome is to actually match the founder with one or many of the mentors in that room to actually achieve those uh, key objectives before the next session. And we do that in a split setting, so repeat, we repeat that process four times in a year, meaning that we are not an accelerator, we are not an incubator, but we provide really key milestone in the year of a founder to articulate everything that they do uh, around those high-level objectives. Mm -hmm. And to give it uh, a very concrete example, Fabien is also lucky to be part of Creative Destruction Lab Paris on climate and part of the incubator at HC Paris. And so we can see the value of having uh, a support at different level, defining a roadmap and having some day-to-day -day, uh, support and maybe more practical meetings and collaboration. Mm -hmm. And so that's why the specificity of uh, Creative Destruction Lab is really about focusing on technology first and then building a company around that technology. Mm -hmm. And so you have a specific uh, vertical on climate. So it's science and tech based, um, specifically dedicated to climate. Have, what have you seen over the past month on, on this vertical or on this specific uh, climate uh, issues? Do you have more companies or more ideas generated? Is it, what, are the, what are the trends? Well, it's kind of the complexity of doing something on climate. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people know in that room, but complex is very abstract a concept. Mm -hmm. So what we do uh, at CDL is that our job is also in big part to do the scouting and the sourcing of venture to build uh, an ideal cohort. And so for that, we really focus as much as possible on the size of the impact that can be done by technology. So sometimes we meet with very promising company, very interesting technology, but for which the impact is can be very limited compared to what can be done in the mining industry, for example. So that's f one of our main criteria is really to be industry and technology agnostic, but to be really impact focused. And Emma will uh, probably uh, agree with that. It really has the measurement, the intentionality of the size of the impact generated it's what we look at the most. And this is why actually in our room, uh, so this year we supported 18 uh, companies at first, uh, and they actually come from very different industries. So we have some in the fashion industry, uh, producing uh, actually biotech made uh, leather uh, to replace all of the luxury uh, item uh, which are leather made. So we have uh, the mining and energy industry. So we have some other venture working in the, in the um, wind turbine uh, to, to change the, the shape of, uh, of the blade. We have some venture um, replacing microplastics in cosmetics. Um, we have some other uh, working in the uh, construction industry uh, with aging and maintenance. So basically what we see is that all of the industries and every value chain can be positively impacted by some of those technologies. And so it's really complicated for us to be too narrow and to focus too much because there are really still at this time low hanging fruits in many industries. I mean, they are not that low hanging, but still with great technology and great entrepreneurs, we see that we can have massive impact because the differential, the gap between what's coming in a few years and what's actually uh, what the current state of the situ situation is, is still quite huge. Okay, thank you, Emeric. So just as you're focusing on science and technology, Emma, you are the <laughs> director of impact entrepreneurship programs at HSC. And uh, so maybe you can give us your perspective on how 
um, and social entrepreneurship and climate are linked? And what are the trends that you see uh, to this regard? Uh, thank you, Laurence. Um, so it's, a, it's a very, it's a huge question mm -hmm. because uh, the link between social entrepreneurship and climate um, is is very is quite obvious in a way, and still may, maybe a bit more difficult to see compared to um, very technical or technological solutions. So. Um, the, the program we have within the Entrepreneurship and Innovation Center at HC, um, which um, aims at supporting impact entrepreneurs, um, are more dedicated to um, what we call uh, Economie Sociale et Solidaire uh, and social entrepreneurship, so social SMEs. Um, and we are more into this idea of inclusion, I would say, first. And when we organized this uh, conference, we realized also with the team that um, our entrepreneurs are very engaged um, towards uh, the climate change reduction, mitigation, adaptation in, in many, many ways. And sometimes in more direct or indirect um, ways. What is very interesting uh, first, I would say, f with these kind of entrepreneurs, social entrepreneurs, um, is first, um, that I would say they're political entrepreneurs. And it's a bit different with uh, maybe startups or uh, technical solutions um, which address a specific point and specific impact because they're used to um, sometimes getting subsidies, having regulated activities with the state, with local authorities. And so they also, they are used to lobbying for good uh, as, um, as would uh, Alberto Alemano say. Um, so um, it, it's a way to um, push forward the society towards more inclusion, uh, more uh, circular economy, um, or um, ag um, ecological agriculture, urban agriculture. So um, they, they see trends and they have a vision, a mission, and they're very linked with local ecosystems, local authorities to um, get involved, cooperate with local authorities towards more regulation, more regulation towards inclusion, social inclusion and environment. And I think they're pushing for, they're pushing also the regulators, the states as citizens and as entrepreneurs uh, towards more regulation. It's very clear um, in France with the inclusion sector which has been pushed by entrepreneurs who then uh, enter the government, for instance. But it's, it's also true for, for climate and the environment. So that's the first thing um, I would say. And then uh, when we look at the specific activities, there are many um, different companies. Um, I would take maybe two examples. Uh, the first one is quite obvious. Uh, we have a lot of um, SMEs which we support within the Accelerator ESS which is a program supported by the Région Île-de-France. Um, they're, um, they're in the circular economy and they um, will deal with um, reconditioning of electronic material, for instance, computers. And the, with the COVID-19 um, and the, the uh, breakdown of many supply chains in the electronic industry, we also had to um, rethink and uh, redesign all these uh, supply chains. And one of our entrepreneurs, uh, Ecoder uh, an Enterprise, um, they multiplied the production by eight, producing um, so new laptops, Lenovo mainly, for companies. And so it means it's uh, as much, uh, as many computers, as much materials that is not uh, mined, that is not produced in China, elsewhere, that is not transported, but that is locally uh, reconditioned, also uh, by disabled people. So it's a way of doing things in a very systematic approach and, and systemic approach. Um, we also have a company which raised um, 18 million euros a few months ago. Uh, Mulino, and what is very interesting with them is that so they they collect organic waste in restaurants or, or uh, at uh, places where um, um, employees or students eat mainly, and they um, 
they do lombricompostage. So not, I don't know how to say it in English, but they compost it with uh, swarms. Yeah, with, with swarms. Um, and then they sell uh, the ton of earth, of soil, let's say, to agriculture to nourish the soil. And they have um, really uh, excellent quality of the soil they, they produce with organic waste from restaurants. Um, and what is interesting with them is that in this very um, systemic approach that they have is that they also decided um, to do so, to collect the waste, to um, launch... Uh, um, a work integration program, entreprise um, d'insertion, I'm not sure of the words in English, so that people who, are, who were unemployed could also get training uh, and get um, a bridge towards employment with this enterprise. So they see not only the um, environmental problem, the climate problem, but they see also the whole consequence on, on society. And, um, and I think it's very interesting because when, when we think about um, climate change and innovation, we tend to think, uh, how can we mitigate? How can we reduce and innovate to do uh, the same kind of things with less? But one, there are also two di dimensions that we should not um, forget. The one is, is um, in a way, um, what you did not mention, but that is in your business, is that um, when you get the nickel with the, the plant that you form, uh, you don't mine, but you also don't mine in places that are even more dangerous for climate. For instance, Greenpeace just launched a new campaign recently um, to prevent companies from mining, within, uh, mining in the oceans, at the bottom of the oceans because uh, it's mining for rare earth um, in this case, but one of the main risks is that we don't know to what extent it may unlock uh, new tons of CO2. And so they're pushing the UN to uh, take action against this kind of practices. So it's also, how do we avoid new sources of uh, climate uh, pollution of CO2 emissions? And then there is also resilience. So, and I think we, we push our entrepreneurs into this reflection, but they're also, they're already in it, that we need to adapt. Climate change is here, and we haven't seen the, the, even the smallest part of it. So we, we will need to adapt, and we'll need to change the whole system. And I think they're, each of them, in a patchwork mode, they are providing solutions that are very relevant uh, at a local level, and one of the main challenge for them is how do you scale the impact when the impact is relevant somewhere? And this is the kind of thing that you did in Ivory Coast. When it is relevant somewhere for a specific political, geopolitical, economic context, how do you make sure that uh, when doing it elsewhere, you have the same impact uh, at least? Mm -hmm. So you also mentioned that you have a specific program for women as a target, um, because you know, we, either we enter through science and tech or through the social dimension, but you also have a, a program specifically designed to, to uh, foster entrepreneurship among women. Can you say a couple of words about this and how this is also related to uh, climate? Yeah, yeah, um, that's also something that is, um, maybe not obvious uh, for, for many people that um, training female entrepreneurs may be related to um, the fight against climate change. Um, so we, um, we operate this program at HEC called HEC Stand Up. It's been, um, it's been operated since 2012, so we are, it's our 10th anniversary. <laughs> it's the, the round table of anniversaries today. But, um, and, uh, at first, it was really how do we provide training and access for entrepreneurship to women um, in different areas, especially in suburban areas in Ile-de-France, in the Paris region, um, to provide uh, opportunities and to make sure they develop autonomy and uh, financial independence. And we had the chance within the, the Women's Forum to um, reflect with researchers on this interaction between women and climate. Um, and one of the things that is very interesting is that when you look at the, the, the part of the, the world population that is the poorest, so 1.3 billion people, 
70% uh, of them are women. So um, we have a huge uh, concern here because they are the ones who will suffer climate change the most. That's, that's the first thing. Um, the second thing is that when you look at agricultural agriculture um, supply chains, uh, actually l almost 80% of the, the whole global agriculture production is held, uh, is managed by women today in the world, even if they don't uh, get the credit, if they don't own the land, etc. And um, the last thing I, I, I can also talk to you about is um, when you look at the priority when dealing with climate change, Project Drawdown in uh, 2020 made a list of the, the um, 100 activities that were um, supposed to uh, have a huge impact on, on climate change mitigation. And the sixth uh, in the list is educating girls, and the seventh is family planning. Because we know with the education of women and, and our also with female entrepreneurs, I will talk to you uh, about it as well. Um, there is a cascading effect, so to speak. So we we see that it has an influence, it has an impact on the children, on their health, or on their nutrition. Just give you to give you a number. Um, a UN report showed that when you give uh, ten dollar um, to a woman, um, to uh, in, uh, ten dollar increase to a woman, it has the same beneficial impact on children's health and nutrition than giving a uh, $110 increase to a man. So there is also a huge uh, impact in helping women because they are the center of community, the center of families, and they can engage around. And this is what we see at HSC Stand Up because we also deploy, um, operate the program in uh, on in French overseas uh, territories, so uh, French Caribbean islands or La Réunion, and we see that, for instance, here, locally, women are very very engaged within their communities. So they they train people, they train communities, they train local authorities, and they will also um, create projects that are rethinking. Uh, classic value chain, classic supply chains. So um, if they launch, let's say, a very classic business of pastries, uh, cooking or uh, cosmetics, they will think about the ingredients, where does it come, how can they innovate in the sourcing, how can they make it more uh, environmentally friendly and climate resilient. And one example is very, very interesting. Um, one of our entrepreneurs here in Paris, she launched a pastry um, brand, um, which is working very, very uh, well. And she does um, luxury pastry, I would say, with non-gluten uh, uh, ingredients. And one of them is Fonio. And Fonio is a cereal um, produced in uh, West Africa that is very resilient to drought, very resilient to um, the Flood. Flood. Flood as well, thank you. Um, and that, that requires not as uh, much care as would wheat, for instance. And it's non-gluten, as I said, and it's very good for health with because of the protein, etc. So she, she is also in a in a logic of promoting new value chains, new ways of sourcing that we think are very uh, interesting because they have an eye that we don't have or that sometimes in some sector men don't have. And this is why training female entrepreneurs is also very interesting in that uh, view. Okay, thank you, Emma. Before handing uh, the... the, the handing over to the room for some questions and then we'll come back to the panel. Um, I would like to ask, I think it's very striking to see how social and environmental are actually linked. Um, maybe you have other examples. Do you want to give one example, Robin, on how in your business uh, they are linked? Um, if I remember correctly, that we, we had a, a little story during the deployment of the solution in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, in the west part, in cocoa production. So uh, there was a, a big uh, 
meeting in order to decide whether they are going to allow us to, to put the devices on the satellite dishes or not. So a lot of uh, people in the room weren't like, they, they, they disagree with the, the project because they, they thought that we can access to the, the TV channel, they, they will be looking with the device. We explained that it wasn't the case and the um, one person changed the, the debate and the conclusion of the debate was the wife of the uh, the, uh, the the like the mayor of the the area, and she she arrived in in the in this room and she she said that uh, considering the 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 changes of uh, weather and especially during the rainy season, uh, she thought that this system will be with more benefit than impact uh, in this area. So thanks to, to her voice, we were allo allowed to, to deploy the, the system there. And I think without, without the, her, it, it wasn't possible. So yes, in some cases, in especially in this, this area, uh, it could be very, it's very important to, to associate every member of particular communities in order to 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 address these, these kind of uh, uh, topics. Yeah, and your your business has a direct impact, also a social impact, because when you help uh, farmers to know the risks that uh, that they that can occur, it's it also has a big social impact, right? Yes, and and especially in during this production, because we we saw that the if if you like chocolate. It's time to buy some chocolate because the prices are going to be very high uh, next year. So we, we had a terrible season, rainy season last year. So um, if I can give you an example, in, in between San Pedro, Soubre and Sassandra, it's a very, very particular area in Côte d'Ivoire. Uh, it's in a traditional year, it rains between 1,200 millimeters. And during the last rainy season, so if we, we take the 12 previous months before this rainy season, we are already ob above 2,000 millimeters. So it's very bad for the, the pods and for the cocoa production. So we know that the, the first producer of 40% uh, of the world consumption will be short by 3 or 6% of the, the production and the, um, the, the consumption is still um, increasing. So uh, if you if you like chocolate, it, it's time to, to 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 buy some chocolate now before the prices inc increase. But more important for the producer locally, it's that they they can do the, the right treatments before the rainy season, which, which is starting right now, in order to avoid the the, the development of a disease of the swollen pod uh, spot uh, on, on the on the pods. Mm. Fabien, any link between your environmental impact and the social, more the social side? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, I think it's, it's not a secret that uh, the mining industry is uh, catastrophic in terms of uh, social impact. Uh, if you look at the copper belt, for instance, mm -hmm. um, especially Congo, etc., in Africa, we estimate that around 15% of the labor force um, is under 18, right, so children. Um, there's semi-state of slavery uh, as well that are involved. And if you think about it, like the mining industry is not that much labor intensive. Uh, so you deploy a lot of capital um, at the beginning, but very, very few people are actually paid to do that. And when they are, they are super well trained, um, very well educated, etc. And I'm not going to mention any names, but some Australian miners are very reputed um, to do that, actually. So they're just sending, like, uh, in Africa, their own people, um, I would say. And they take the resources and they just leave. And uh, the impact for the population is, um, is a real problem. So the way we are thinking about it is actually um, to make this industry way more labor-intensive than what it is. And to train people uh, to to know how to um, harvest uh, their own lands, I would say. So the the impact is quite uh, is quite strong, especially as nickel is a pollutant uh, in soil. So it means that these lands they are not arable. So you cannot you cannot um, grow anything on it. Mm. So what you're doing is that you're removing the nickel across time, 
And the plants were using our nitrogen fixator. So you fixate nitrogen uh, in salts and you make them uh, arable. So it means that when you leave, these people that you've trained, that have uh, worked with you actually directly uh, on sites, uh, they will have learned a job and they have lands that they can use directly. And I would say like the last point is um, regarding the downstream processing. So um, in the downstream processing, so basically the last part of our processes, um, when we recover the metal, we are producing biochar that is used back in the field as fertilizer. We are producing um, metal directly that is used locally um, or, or not, it depends, but we prefer to uh, sell it locally uh, to producers and you're producing energy. Um, especially in the intertropical regions, you know, like the price of energy, it's extremely high uh, because you're in very remote uh, villages where nobody cares about uh, bringing, um, I would say, energy there. And so it means that basically you have an impact on the development um, of the communities there because they have access to energy, while it was not the case before. Mm. Mm -hmm. If I may, Laurence, um, I think your example is very interesting from uh, the perspective of the, the last book of Bruno Latour. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, it's very, very interesting. Uh, I would not say cool because <laughs> it's Bruno Latour. But, um, and he explains how a new ecological class, social class could emerge. And one of the things he says um, that is, I think, r very linked to what entrepreneurs for climate are doing and what you're doing compared to um, classic mining companies. He says um, the classic logic around um, the, the, the class within society is about production. Um, everyone, uh, workers or um, owner of capital, they are all aligned on the fact that increasing production is good. And the, the only question with uh, the, the Marxist theory, for instance, was to say, um, how, do we, um, how do we share the products, uh, the, the, the value generated by production? But we're very aligned on the fact that increasing production is good for everyone. The only thing is, how do we share it? And he says, now we have a new paradigm uh, which means that we cannot stay in the same way of analyzing the society and the political um, clashes, I would say. And he says we need to go from an era of production to an era of generation. And he, he calls it engendrement in French. And this is this very idea that um, if we want to uh, keep interacting with nature, we need to um, recognize that we'll live thanks to and with nature and the, the, the local ecosystems, the natural ecosystems we depend on. And so this is recognizing and acknowledging that we depend on this ecosystem and we need to uh, collaborate, cooperate with it, with this kind of uh, thing that I'm going to take some resources, but give some at another stages and, and make sure that there is an equilibrium towards um, uh, nature preservation, but also our own preservation uh, on the long term. And I think your example is, is very interesting in this, to exemplify uh, what Bruno Latour says with this uh, paradigm shift from production to generation in a way. And actually, maybe just a short comment before we move on to the question, but uh, I think what something that we see which is very interesting is that there is a big challenge today to give, kind of level the playing field of giving everyone the ability to contribute to uh, impact change. Like, today it's quite easy, if I'm a t scientist or an MBA graduate, to do a career change and go work for uh, climate or an impact startup. I have the means to do that, but if I'm a, in a blue collar uh, job, like my options are quite reduced and I'm very often first not sensitized and then not able to move to a different position that would give me uh, the ability to have an impact. And we see that the switch becomes that really at this point when climate startups cease to be startups and become actual company and that's where you open uh, new factories, new producing plants and that's where you are starting to hire 
not only engineers and scientists and uh, HSC graduate, but also uh, factory workers, blue collar uh, people. And it's really very empowering to create this uh, ability, all of those new, new hires to be in a company that matters before and uh, while before they were just working for whatever was available. So we really see that we have this social mission of not only targeting the people who have the means to contribute to climate change, but also the ones that are uh, in a more traditional industry and more traditional positions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So maybe it's uh, time to uh, ask uh, to see whether there are some questions in the room. And if not, I still have plenty of questions. So, but uh, <laughs> let's see if there are some uh, questions. That I think there's zero. Thank you, merci, Asus. Uh, I'm uh, George from uh, Ro um, Romania and from the HEC MBA. Um, my question is for Fabien. Um, in your process of um, extracting the nickel, can you tell us a bit about the uh, volume of water that is used and how it uh, is uh, um, deposed at the end and how is this different from extracting the other um, the nickel from conventional? And um, the second question is for Emma. Um, how do you see the future of the job of um, political um, uh, climate uh, startup or let's say lobbyist, the good lobbyist? Thank you. I don't know. <laughs> okay, a lot of questions in, in only one question. <laughs> well done. I'm sorry about it. No, no, no worries. Um, okay, let's start with the traditional way of uh, extracting metal, okay? So minus what they do, very simply, okay, is that they dig very big holes with explosives to make it simple, okay? They remove uh, rocks with metal, okay, that is crushed. And in this, they're going to crush it to uh, have like lower granulometry after they put it at a very high temperature with acids, okay? It's called hydrometallurgy. Or like in some cases, like in Indonesia, for instance, they are using high pressure as well, uh, so it's h bar. On other ways, we are going to use pyrometallurgy uh, with um, uh, very high temperature and also chemicals. I'm sorry, it's a very technical answer, but it was a very technical question as well. Um, so what we are doing is based on the place where we operate, we are looking at a lot of factors to select the sites where we are going. One of these factors is the hydric stress uh, we have directly uh, on site. So if the hydric stress is very high, we are going uh, for what we call bio-leaching. So it means like we are not even using water. In this case, we are using bacteria to precipitate the metal directly. So it's kind of an um, anaerob anaerobic uh, kind of uh, recovery of the, um, of the metal by using bacteria that's going to degrade uh, the biomass and not the metal. So that's the, that's the case where basically there's an hydric stress, so we cannot operate with, with water. So, for instance, we thought about this on uh, some countries uh, directly in, um, in Central Africa. So, when there is water that is available, um, you're looking at something that is uh, quite, um, I would say, quite, um, uh, quite ecological, as basically we can re we reuse the water directly. So, we neutralize the acidity of the water, we reduce it uh, as it is directly, and we introduce more acids, if that makes sense. So, acid is the only thing that we need to bring actually. Uh, and could you repeat your question to me? Because you said, what is the future of... Yes, of, uh, you said that the emergence of um, political good lobbyists is coming up and um, basically there are people that are really connected with the local um, communities and they are pressing for the good lobby, as um, as you mentioned, um, Alberto Alemano's um, um, s organization. So, do you see that this is a job that would really scale up in the future? Thank you. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so, I think there are two 
trends. The first one is um, quite old, I would say, um, because in France, um, with the sector of ESS, Économie Sociale et Solidaire, um, there are companies uh, which have specific status, um, which make them eligible for certain types of um, of contracts or of uh, markets. So they have reserved markets, for instance, for local authorities. They have uh, specific subsidies. They are helped by the state when they want to employ um, people in uh, work integration or um, uh, disabled people, etc. So they have they are specific kind of hybrid um, businesses. Uh, within this social uh, and solidarity economy. And these entrepreneurs are very used, and it's, sometimes it's, it's not always good for them when they scale up. They're very used to turn to um, the, the public authorities, the, um, the local authorities, to uh, ask for subsidies, for help. Um, and one of the big trends over the, the past, I would say, five, ten years, um, is that there has been a, a, a push from these local authorities, uh, the state services, the state um, uh, institutions, to have them rethink their business model in a way that they are less dependent on um, on subsidies, and they're they're trying to um, develop new new business models. So uh, it's working, but they have kept this DNA, this very specific DNA, um, to interact a lot with uh, local authorities, public authorities, regions, and to interact um, and express their needs as social entrepreneurs, as entrepreneurs who employ people in very difficult uh, situations, who are fighting uh, to, uh, against uh, waste or this kind of thing. So, and they are very linked to very, um, they are engaged in very local um, uh, topics sometimes. So they also engage policy makers. And um, what is very interesting as well is that sometimes they are also in a niche that, is, um, that was created because of the regulation or because of a lack of regulation. Um, there is a very interesting example of a um, company which provides um, support, uh, phone support, uh, not only with the voice, as a matter of fact, for deaf people. And so they provide a very high quality uh, support um, with um, uh, people who are also deaf and can help them uh, understand. Uh, and so they sell it to SFR, to many uh, different customers. And now the state is passing a new law to uh, make this kind of service, of accessibility service, even more inclusive. And so now they are in a position where they innovated at first because there was a lack of regulation and they provided something that was very innovative on the market for, uh, to include uh, deaf people for this kind of support. And now they're faced with a regulation that is kind of uh, killing the market, I would say, or killing the, the social need. So there is this permanent, this continuous uh, need for this kind of entrepreneurs to be connected with policymakers to make sure that the law evolve in a way that it creates social impact for the long term in a very good and, and, and high quality uh, way. So this is one of example. And, and the second part of the, the answer is that um, this is the, the, the CEO of the Maif, which is one of the biggest mutualist uh, company, wrote a book uh, which title is the uh, 21st century uh, company will be political or will, will not be, something like that. Uh, and I think that now um, CEOs and entrepreneurs are urged by uh, civil society, by governments, by consumers to take action and to take position. And so they also have to, to claim for a vision and, and um, 
a mission as, uh, with the entreprise à mission and to express that they will be part of the solution. And I think it's very interesting because when you look at the, tre the trend from the Silicon Valley with the startup ecosystem which was born here, uh, there, what is very interesting is that it does not come from the same um, philosophical background. The main background there was the libertarian ideology that entrepreneurs should provide for uh, uh, instead of the state, that th they should do things without the state. Um, so they, this is not the same way of acting, and I think there is a specific European way of, of really uh, acting, being entrepreneur, with, uh, in, in a very specific link with local authorities at different level and uh, the civil society, so in a nutshell. Other questions? Uh, yeah, um, my name is Fatima. I'm also part of the uh, HEC MBA program. Uh, my questions for uh, Ruben and Fabian. Um, both of your business models essentially involves uh, close interaction with the local stakeholder, right? Like in, in the case of uh, geomines, I'm assuming you'll have to engage with a farmer who essentially cultivates the crop for you. This is an assumption, you can correct me. And, and in case of uh, Ruben, I'm assuming to sell your uh, product, you have to reach out to the, the essentially the satellite owner and interact with them to uh, get the permission to fix your product. So my question is, uh, how do you get them to be part of your business model? Uh, how do you get them to buy your idea? Uh, and how, how are how are they compensated for it? And second question is, what challenges do you face when it comes to scaling your business model, uh, apart from finance, because finance in general is a challenge for all startups. Uh, I hope you don't face that, <laughs> but what other challenges do you face when it comes to scaling up? Thank you very much for, for the question. So um, the first part, how I convince people to install the, the device on their places. Uh, two there is two strategies. Um, the first big uh, deployment we, we did is uh, in the south of France. I didn't talk a lot about it, but we, we deploy 1,000 sensors in 14 French departments. And in order to find the location, we present the ID to the civil security members, especially to firefighters, because the firefighters in France they they do the they rescue they rescue people and they also uh, handle the the fire security and the flash flood security. So when you have some flooding, it's the firefighters coming and evacuate the people or cutting the the roads. So in this case, uh, in order to have the authorization to install the device, we, we, we give them the data from the system f in exchange of the location for the devices. So when we install in a sensor on, fi uh, on a firefighter's building in South of France, they have access to the data collected on this location and also of the data collected with the the complete network. So this is the first strategy. The second strategy, especially in Côte d'Ivoire, is uh, that uh, the device is connected to a satellite dishes. So um, it's uh, easy to convince someone to give him the television in exchange of what we, we put the device. So we did installation of complete system in Abidjan and in the west part of uh, Côte d'Ivoire. We did um, the, the antenna on the roof, the weather sensor, and then the television in the in the home of the people uh, uh, having the, the sensor at the places. Um, for the for the, the satellite company, we don't have to ask any uh, authorization it's like listening at the noise on the streets. We are only looking at the noise of the atmosphere on the on the, uh, on the TV signals. And for the last question about the the, um, the most impact 
Yes, uh, what what we the, the the issue what we we have in order to deploy the solution, first of all is the hiring processes and to to have an access to to people and to hire people in the company. So it was the, a huge challenge for us. We start uh, small with only a, a small team, and we had to expand the team especially for data sciences, scientists, web developer, and also in the commercial and marketing part. It was very uh, difficult to find people, and uh, I think there is a, there is a, this is a, a one of the most challenging uh, thing in, in the, the previous month and previous uh, years. Uh, we, we have a very particular uh, de de web developers uh, in the company because they are all, uh, they, they were doing other jobs before. I have one paleontologist, uh, a former musician from the army, uh, fire security guy, and uh, um, a guy working in a restaurant, and they all do reconversion process in no, they work with uh, with a uh, for H T R N with with us, and I'm very proud of the, the team we are, are building in the past month. So this this was the, the most challenging issue for for my company. So if talent acquisition is your challenge, yeah. you have quite some students in the room, so uh, don't hesitate to uh, to ask what you need and uh, maybe there will be some people interested. And before the end of the year, we are going to hire four people. So we, we need some people in project delivery because we, we do some hardware deployment, but also the, the fabrication of the hardware. We do it in, in South of France in a factory. So it's, uh, we, we choose to, 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 to do the device made in France and not uh, made in China. Uh, so we need someone in project delivery, we need also someone for, for the, the sales process, and we, we will need also some people in data science. Okay. Maybe to answer your question, because I think it's an excellent question. Um, actually, building local communities um, is, is key, especially for us. Uh, in mining, basically, a village of 1,000 people can block a project that will bring m billions of revenues over the 10, 20 years to come. It's crazy. Like uh, you can check, uh, check out a project called the Montagne d'Or uh, in uh, Guyane Francaise. It's crazy, like it was a village of 1,000 people. We blocked it, it would have, de it would have delivered uh, billions uh, over years uh, for good reasons. I mean, for ecological reasons, etc. cetera. Um, so on our side, what we've done is that we've recruited one person that is doing that 100% of his time. And believe me, that's a great job is traveling everywhere in the world just to build um, this relationship with the people. In Albania, for instance, we discovered that um, peop the, 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 the people like in the village, what they wanted was fishnets because they are fishermen and the thing is that for them it cost a lot to replace them. And so we just, we bought some for them. That is kind of thing, but this kind of insights, you have to go on field and talk to a lot of people, uh, create trust with them, it takes a lot of time and there's I don't have like a secret tip or whatever. It's just take, it takes a lot of time, but that's critical. It's super important. And regarding scaling, the second question. Uh, I think the answer is different for all companies, but basically the um, strategy we went for was basically we are a research company and we are building uh, joint ventures with equity partner on each side to be able to scale rapidly without having to deploy uh, immense amount of capital. And other challenges that you're facing today? Maybe we can uh, also answer the question about the challenges. So uh, for Ruben, it was talent acquisition. Um, we, we have three main issues at the moment, I would say. Um, the first one is a regulatory one, because what we are doing, nobody has done before. So the thing is that we discuss with the regulator, telling him, OK, we think we should be regulated this way. But by country, it's a very, very different answer because some people, they, they would see us as a mining company, some of them, they, they would see us as farmers, some of them would see us as a depollution company because you're removing a pollutant in the soil, et cetera, et cetera. And so you need to engage uh, with the regulator to have this conversation about, we think we should be regulated this way because the implication for us, if we become a mining company, it's a big problem. 
so you continue to have permits, etc., etc. You're also a political entrepreneur. Mm. I have to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and for and for the two other issues, um, we have recruited. We are we are 12 people at the moment. Most of our team um, is researchers. Okay, they are researchers. Um, and there's a cultural clash that is very, very important when you have like operation an operation team uh, that is business oriented and, <laughs> and another team that is more research uh, oriented. You you need to uh, spend a lot of time to make sure that people can communicate uh, the right way and to embark everybody with your vision. Um, so I would say that, that the second one and the third one is, and I think that's the same for all entrepreneurs navigating the current environment. I don't know if you see what's happening, huge inflation, uh, COVID is not killing only people, but supply chain as well, which is a major issue. Um, you have like interest rates uh, decided by the Fed that are just huge. And so it's, um, the current environment is very, very difficult uh, to navigate. Um, on our side, like we are very lucky we close our round uh, before this period because I'm, uh, yeah, good luck to everybody now because it's quite difficult. Yeah, and I think it's quite fascinating to hear you both on this because um, at least it fascinates me to see that um, whichever the level of technology within an enterprise, the human factor is mm. is tremendously important. And uh, w when you, you look at how do you engage people, how do you engage communities, stakeholders, these are the skills of tomorrow's impact enterprises and so I think if we want to also um, be active towards these issues of these issues of climate change and climate mitigation we also ne need to rethink ways of working together collaborating engaging people engaging communities and um, we need to learn it so th these are skills that need to be learned and that actually I think you learn here at HC and you will learn uh, in your different professional experience and it also needs to be capitalized on. And, and the, the example I was giving on uh, Moulineau earlier, the, the uh, organic waste um, collecting company, uh, they had the same issue when they scaled, when they, re they reached um, 100 employees. Um, we, we went on a mission with them, it was in um, 2019, 2020. Uh, 2020 and and there were um, quite a lot within the companies and it was kind of a new a new step and the the, the director the, the CEO said I, I don't know everyone now by the name so we have to change a few things and I see that people are not engaged in the same way so we had a a support to make sure that everyone could share their view of the vision of the mission of the enterprise and align everyone on where are we going? What is the vision? What is the mission to make sure we engage people? Because at the end of the day, uh, collecting organic waste uh, and, and making compost out of it that you sell to agriculture and you contribute to um, the agricultural transition, it's very good. But you, you still need people to collect uh, the waste, to go from restaurant to restaurant, to get up early, um, to be there, to not to be absent, to be engaged, and and people need to find at this level as well a purpose and and something to um, to be linked to uh, in the mission of the enterprise. So they they did a tremendous work to make sure that at ev every level of the company, people were uh, also engaged. And and I think this human factor um, is not to be dismissed or um, uh, really. Um, under evaluate in the, the, the thing that will make uh, the innovative companies work when it comes to uh, fighting and mitigating climate change. Yeah. Yeah. We have another question. Uh, yeah. So, uh, thanks everyone for the, the lesson and all your precious insight about being an impact entrepreneur. Uh, just to build on what you said, um, I would like to know just about not the entrepreneurs but the investors. Like, is it easier or maybe more difficult for you to raise uh, money, to raise equity, and uh, or maybe it's the same? Uh, and second question, like, who are the investors? Like, is it traditional VC? Uh, is it more corporate VC? Is it like VC with a specific focus on climate and social issues, or is it like the BPE or sovereign wealth funds? 
So it's just about investors to have more insight from all your experience. Thank you. Should I start? Yeah. Um, okay. So the first. Qu okay. So let's answer the one on the on the on the investors. Um, our investors uh, is a US VC called Lower Carbon Capital, um, led by Chris Saka. I don't know if you know um, uh, the guy. He's a billionaire that invested in Instagram, Twitter, Uber, etc. Very early on. So he became rich. Um, became rich this way. Yeah, they, are, they have a focus that is very climate oriented, and we have taken as well uh, four BAs, uh, so four business angels um, together. So that would be the. Um, and what was your other question? Sorry. Ah, is it easier now? No, not anymore. <laughs> so yeah, until like two weeks ago, it was easier. I was I was in San Francisco actually. I, I came back uh, on uh, this Sunday, um, and. So what is happening is that the limited partners, um, um, basically they have injected a lot of money in, this, uh, in, in the funds at the moment. So there's a lot of money in the, in the market. That's not the, the problem. But the thing is that there's a lot of uncertainty regarding what is going to happen with Ukraine. Um, is the COVID is something that's going to stop or can we, can we find, find a workaround, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so paradoxically, even if there's a lot of money in the system, at the moment, the way uh, the LPs are deploying capital is in, in a very, very, very cautious way now. So they are, we, they are pulling uh, out, for instance, uh, uh, term sheets that they, that they did, this kind of thing. It's very, very complicated now. But luckily for us, I mean, we closed, <laughs> we closed before this period, but uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's becoming quite complex. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, because it's... Uh, it's a huge question and it's a very interesting one. Um, for Forrest, we, we start from PhD work and then we, we had to, to go through the death valley <laughs> between <laughs> something uh, nice in the lab and the product with uh, the product market fit. And if I look at the, the, the road, it was quite complicated to, to do the first fundraising and to do the seed fundraising. And I want to, to thank Incubator HSA because they, they really helped us because we start to, to say that we, we want to, to, to raise money just before, like three months before COVID. When we were locked down the first time, everything stopped with this uh, fundraising event. And at the end of the lockdown, we integrated the HSC incubator at uh, Station F. And we, we had the help of a lot of people uh, struggling with the same issues and the same problems in order to, to find the right investors. They helped us and they, they, they did a, a very good work in order to, to help us to, to find the way to describe the project and also to build something that it, it's, uh, if I, if I have to, to give you an, an advice, if you start your company, your startup, your startup or another kind of company, you need to think and to build a company, not a nice product for VCs. Uh, the idea is that if you do so, you will find the right people who are going to, f to give you funds. So um, for HDRN, we have new funds, so traditional VC, uh, Kima, the um, from uh, Xavier Niel, and we have a corporate B uh, VC. Uh, it's uh, a part of Touton, and it's linked to Cocoa production. So we we did the fundraising now 15, 16, 16 months uh, ago, and uh, I think I enjoy most this this part from the fundraising until now. It was very exciting and even more exciting than the very beginning, but it wasn't uh, easier. It was more challenging. <laughs> I think maybe to add up to, uh, to that answer uh, and regarding your question uh, about uh, business angel versus traditional VCs, I think we can see one of the issue of doing something completely new is that some VC tend to use framework and it's very reassuring. I mean, it's all about managing LP's expectations and so helping our sometimes uh, pretty demanding people. And so taking uh, additional risk uh, is something that might not always uh, go easily with them. And th 
so compared to you know uh, powerful uh, high net worth uh, business angel they have the ability and the let's say <laughs> simpler decision making process to take risk and actually to believe uh, on a funding team in a specific technology and so if you are doing something which is completely innovative it can be easier to to unlock uh, key innovators instead of going through traditional routes um, yeah, I, w I would just add uh, something to this: is that when you um, when you want to have a price round, uh, business angels they will look at who is leading uh, basically your your round. So, at some point you need you need a VC, especially if your round is quite big, you'll have no choice. Because the things that otherwise, like BAs, they are going to agree between between them on uh, on giving you like a lower valuation. And basically, what you want to do is like to play on uh, creating a competition between VC funds to increase uh, your valuation, and then tell the BAs it's a price round. You have to align on the valuation that I got uh, with my lead. If that makes sense. And just maybe uh, in terms of testimony, keep in mind the way the difference between uh, you know different types of startup, mean like high technology ventures, tend to require a lot more uh, capital expenses in R&D or capex. And uh, so you cannot really do a quick uh, pilot, validate it, and just raid uh, 200Ks to, <laughs> to open a mine, uh, sadly. Uh, so it's really, so that's why it's a complex question because depending on the very structure of the company and of the uh, product development, the type of VC or uh, funding available will be uh, completely different. And maybe to add to what's been said that is more on the VC side and the, the, the tech startup side. Um, when you're in social entrepreneurship, there are dedicated funds um, that are less, um, that work a bit less like VC in the way that um, they, they take a risk, but they also assume that um, the, the rentability or the, the, uh, the benefits will come a bit later than what we expect in a uh, in classic startup. So what is very important, depending on the kind of project that you have and on the kind of um, valuation you expect and uh, how long will you uh, wait to get your results, both economically and in terms of impact, you may also want to choose um, a fund uh, an investor that has specific duration of um, investment period. Because uh, keep in mind that uh, when you, in VCs, when they have a fund, they have it for approximately 10 years. So they have five years to deploy the money to invest, and they have five years to sell the companies, to sell the shares to other investors, to, so to exit. So it may push, uh, put a lot of pressure also on the results, on the, 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 the ability of entrepreneurs to uh, deliver quite rapidly the results. And we in s with social enterprise, there are, the, there are funds that are called um, either evergreen or that have duration that are a bit longer, 15 years. So it gives also a bit more time to entrepreneurs uh, to reach their economic and impact um, goals. So I think this is something um, to keep in mind, and also uh, we have a lot of entrepreneurs which um, use very different uh, financial tools. Um, and for instance, even um, impact funds like Amundi or Mirova or even uh, Banque des Territoires, they do uh, quasi-equity um, schemes, so with, with bonds. Um, and it's, it's um, I would say it's also more flexible for the, the enterprise uh, compared to uh, equity as done w by, by VCs. So uh, there are also very different tools, and I think the market is also evolving very, very fast. Um, and even with classic VCs, um, bear in mind that they have from limited partners more and more pressure as well to report on environmental, social governance uh, criteria. So whatever the project, you also will have to to showcase kind of impact or at least extra financial um, objectives and, and impact. Thank you. I think there is a last, do we have time for last question? It's the last uh, question. Yes, I think so. It's just there, just there. 
Um, thank you very much for, for um, your presentation, and I wish your startups every success. Um, um, but my question is, um, in order to achieve that success, um, you deliver climate solutions um, for us, um, for, for the world and for developing economies. I think they can really um, use these startups. But um, in, whilst you deliver these climate solutions, how do you ensure that you know, your startups being also impacted by climate is resilient or is able to adapt to the climate days as we call it? How, how much time we have in order to, <laughs> to answer that? Maybe we can start another round table. Round of <laughs> yeah, um, it's a really good question. Um, as we we start some weather measurements, so four years ago the, f the first measurement we, we we have done now uh, we we have data from in Toulouse from 2018 through 2022 in order to, to observe the, the impact of climate change, I think w you need to have very huge data sets and also to look back in the past in order to, to, to modelize what is going to change. So we are going to do it, for example, in, in territories without any measurements, but we, we have to wait until like, we have enough data in order to, to see the, the trend. And um, for the, the impact of climate change on the company, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question. I, I know that we, we are careful with the, the devices and where we replace them because we know that the, the events are going to be more violent. So we need to think also uh, where and how to, to design a, a network and how is going to be resilient if we have something like twice or 10 times worse than the worst case scenario? Um, and I'll say it comes down to the matrix of choice we're using to, to kind of um, choose the plants we're working with. So we have, we have a way to think about this as a, um, as a dynamic risk exposure. So we never want to be exposed to two risks at the same time. Uh, in each place we 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 are operating on, okay. So basically, what we're going to do, what what we already did, basically, is like to choose plants that are wild types, okay, and that are naturally hyper accumulating a lot of metal in very um, various sets of conditions. So it can be extremely dry. Uh, Sometimes it's uh, it's uh, in intertropical regions where it's uh, very uh, it's, it's okay to be uh, flooded, <laughs> etc. Uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so the thing is that by working with different plants, um, maybe a number of them will fail uh, because of uh, climate change. You're right, because it's going to be become too dry or too hot, et cetera, et cetera. But we have these others, these others that, that are um, going to work, I hope, if it's not too bad, right? So and maybe it's a bit of a meta answer, but uh, what we can see that an increasingly high in, uh, number of companies are asking for data for companies such as HD Rain or Space Data, anything that can help mitigate the risk. That's, I mean, basically what Ruben is doing is providing the future of risk decrease for companies in climate change or in other sector everywhere. Yeah, and I, I think um, navigating uncertainty for entrepreneurs uh, in the times we're living is is one of the skills that is um, much needed. And we also train the entrepreneurs within the accelerator um, to, to envision their company um, in a time frame that is, is far longer, so 10, 20 years, and what will happen uh, that will make them disappear or succeed and, and try to also imagine um, new kind of things. So we, we work a lot with uh, foresight uh, practices, and I think this is something that um, we, we need to, um, to teach to new entrepreneurs, and especially for entrepreneurs acting for climate, so kind of a moving floor, a moving soil, but also any entrepreneurs who want to, um, to launch a company, because being an entrepreneur is mean taking risk and being an entrepreneur right now mean 
uh, means taking risk in an even more, uh, even riskier environment and ever, even more uncertain uh, environment. Um, and it's this, this idea of uncertainty that is everywhere means um, two things, that we will need to communicate a lot with the people within the company to make sure that um, people stay engaged because it can generate a lot of anxiety as we saw uh, during the COVID crisis. And also that when there are risks and changes, it means um, risk, but it also means opportunities. So I think the most successful entrepreneurs will be the one anticipating that uh, they need to uh, buy chocolate, <laughs> you know, anticipating, being able to anticipate um, different scenarios and to not put all their eggs in, in, in the same um, basket. And if you're interested by this question, there is a festival um, starting right now called Et Maintenant, so And Now What, um, about uncertainty that is um, delivered by um, Arte and France Culture, I guess. So um, it, it was on the radio this morning, so. Okay, so I think uh, it's time to close this panel. Thank you very much for your participation and giving us an overview of the role of um, entrepreneurs in innovation for climate. I think we learned a lot, including the fact that we need to buy so chocolate soon, um, but that we also need to uh, engage with local communities that are very strong link between the social and the environmental impact and that it's not only about tech, but also a lot about the human factor. So thank you very much for your participation and thank you for your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Lawrence, and thank you, the panel. We wish you all the best for your startups. And we will